When Scott began his real estate business in 2000, he had one listing last year. He had over 900,000 listings across Australia and New Zealand, and he attributes his success to some quintessentially Australian qualities. He's an optimist, and he's a straight talker and um, clear-cut thinker. So today, Scott is a public speaker and a business mentor and a sales trainer who obviously knows what he's talking about. He also goes really hard at surfing, and he's, um, I can see his wife smile there, <laughs> and he's actually won multiple surfing titles, including winning for Australia at the World Surfing Titles. And not surprisingly, he supports local sports and also the Life, Serving, Life Surf, <laughs> Surf Lifesaving Club here. Now, when I was listing Scotty's achievement, I started to feel a bit tired myself. So I asked him, Scott, what do you do to relax? And very honestly, he said, I don't do anything to relax. He said, I relax when business is going really well. So it made me wonder, perhaps he's living proof of that saying of apparently it was Confucius who said, if you choose a job you love, you'll never do another day's work in your life. So over to you, Scott and Tony. Scott, tell us about, um, from the beginning, where did Scott come from? Yeah, so I'm actually from Sawtell. Uh, I was not born here, but I was, I was raised here. I went to the local primary school and local high school. And I left here um, high school in 1988, so a long time ago. And I was saying that I'm a very proud D-class student, so because I did more surfing than I did studying, which was uh, what I did. So you met your wife when you were quite young, I hear. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't really enjoy partying a lot. I really wanted to find a solid girlfriend. I, I did, first go, so I was really lucky. <laughs> uh, I, found, I found someone that was um, way better than I expected, and I, I certainly was punching above my weight back then. And I, I, I still am today, so I'm very lucky. But we've been together since I've been 16, uh, or since we're 16. We're only four weeks apart in age. And it's been a really, really good journey for us to, to both went to school together and move to Newcastle and come back again and have a company and a business and a family. It's been, yeah, it's been really good. You mentioned that uh, school wasn't that easy for you, but you mentioned also that you were um, part of a single parent, four kids family. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, I, I was part of a, um, a family that was mixed. Probably, I don't know, maybe it's common, but for me... Um, yeah, I had, had older sister and two younger sisters, 10 years apart, a um, couple of different dads and, you know, it was not a problem though. I mean, mum was really good to me, she was flexible, she'd let me do anything that I wanted almost, uh, which was great. So I was allowed to go and work. I, I used to ride my bike to Coffs Harbour and work in restaurants and, and ride along the, it wasn't Link Road, the Pacific Highway with all the trucks in the middle of the night through Lindsay's Cuttings and, you know, so I, mum was great. She'd let me go and do whatever I needed to do to, to get ahead and save money for surfboards and push bikes and that sort of stuff. So, yeah. So one of the success stories for, from my point of view about you was you learned to type quite quickly and quite early. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, here's a funny story for you. I might have been a D-class student, but I wasn't dumb. So I did want to do computers back at high school. I really did. And I thought, well, what I'll do is year nine, you get electives, so you can pick your own courses, right? So I thought what I'll do for the first six months is I'll do secretarial studies and then the second half of the year I'll do the computer studies. So here I was, class of 30, and one guy with 29 secretaries. <laughs> it wasn't a bad gig, I've got to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, I know we can laugh now, but at the time all the guys going, Rrr, and I thought, hey, this is pretty cool, right? <laughs> anyway, so I did the computer studies for the next six months. Um, and I didn't really like the computer teacher and I went, nah, computers isn't for me, I'm out of here, right? I just didn't fit the mould at all. So, but what I did learn to do though during that course, of course, was I learned how to touch type on a QWERTY keyboard. So I could actually be a secretary today if I wanted to be. So, but yeah, if only I could type fast as the girls do, but yeah, I did learn. And he does type fast. Now, tell us about the move to Newcastle. What happened there? Uh, well, when... I straight out of school, went and worked in a glass and aluminium shop, um, so making glass and aluminium uh, door frames and windows and fly screens and that sort of stuff. And Karen and I were talking and she wanted to be a beautician, so we decided to go to Newcastle so she could uh, do a beautician course. So we did, we packed up, 
went down to Newcastle with a, a coffee table and a papasan chair. And that's what we had, right? That was our assets and off we went. So we moved to Newcastle and Karen did the beautician course and I went down there to try and um, look for work. So, yeah, that was in 1989 when we left. So just before the Newcastle earthquake was when we arrived. So um, what happened there? What, what job did you find? Oh, you want me to go into that? Okay, so when... <laughs> What I did do when I got down to, to Newcastle, right, I had no money and I had a pair of old McDonald's pants because I used to work at McDonald's. So I put on these McDonald's pants and I put on a shirt and I went and bought a tie that you zip up and I walked around and I wanted to get a, I wanted to get a career and I really wanted to get into real estate sales. I did because one of the local guys here, he drove a Commodore and I thought, man, that guy's rich, right? <laughs> True story, right? I won't mention his name, but I thought he was rich. So I really wanted to get a job in real estate. So I walked around in Newcastle knocking on doors and asking real estate agents for work, right? And none would give me a job. None. They probably would now, but back then, no one gave me any time of day. I went into banks and all sorts of things, but yeah. So I did go looking for work, and uh, in the end, I, I got given a job with the uh, insurance business. So I ended up, ended up, those guys took me on, they, they trained me how to sell, and they, they gave me a, an opportunity to be a, a commission-only salesperson, and I, I took that opportunity and I ran with that. I bet it was good training, commission sales only. Mm. So tell us about there was always or there's always a moment where you change your direction, you change, you think about things and tell us about, you know, I got stuck, lost wallet, crashed car. Okay, so yeah, I I had a I had a few life changing moments as I went through the nineties. I did ten years selling insurance, by the way. I don't know how, but I did it, and uh, yeah, it was, it was probably one of the best things. I don't regret anything that I did, but I still wonder how I did it for 10 years. But there was a few changes. One, there was this one week way back in the early 90s where I lost my wallet. We left it on the roof of the car, and the car had to get fixed, so I'd spent a few hundred dollars fixing the car. And I got to Friday afternoon. What I needed to make that week was $1,000 so I, I could pay for everything and recover. Um, it meant I didn't, wasn't in front, but it meant I'd earned everything. Anyway, Friday afternoon, I'd made them $1,000, and I was driving home at 4.30 in the afternoon through a place called Curry Curry at the back of Newcastle, and I ran straight at the back of another car. It was a terrible moment. I mean, it's just... But it became one of those life-changing moments. I was sitting on the side of the road crying, right? So here I am crying. I'm, I'm 19 years old going, well, what am I supposed to do, right? It's just... <laughs> what, what's, what's life going to give me? It's just terrible. And that ended up becoming one of those life-changing moments. Where, well, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna have to get serious. And with four weeks later, I'd bought another car, and I really started to get serious. And that's when things started to change. It was like an epiphany moment where I went, well, I really have to start doing things properly. So commitment changed everything, and uh, you started to gain traction. Tell us about traction. Yeah, well. I'd, I'd started to listen to what all the people were teaching me. So at first I thought I knew better as you do, 19 year old. So I started listening to what they were trying to teach. And they started teaching me sales and then I, I started to get a few sales awards and they put me into management. So I ended up in management and they started teaching me how to manage and then I started to have really good sales teams. So the next thing I was winning awards and getting bonuses and everything was going really well. So yeah, no, the, the teaching and training in that business it was a foundation for so many things. So yeah. Having that um, environment where there was so much learning going on was amazing. So, And you had two houses, you were doing well, but you were not happy. Yeah, I had one of those moments when I was about 21 where I went, you know, I'm working away here now. I've started to get some, some momentum. I thought, I want to buy a house. I was really determined to buy a house. My wife was really determined to get married. And I went... <laughs> And I was serious. I said, no, no, we're not getting married until I buy a house. I wouldn't, wouldn't even put an engagement ring on a finger. So I didn't. So I was really adamant. And we bought a house and then I managed to buy a second house because I was really goal orientated. So I bought an investment property. And you're right. Uh, in the end, I felt like everything owned me. And, and as much as I thought I was succeeding, I also felt like everything was starting to own me. And I, my life was going not as cool as I'd like it to be. Um, I ended up fat. I wasn't really healthy at all, right? All I was doing was working and I was going ahead. There was a period there where I didn't even have a break for four years, a four years straight without any breaks at all. No holidays, no Christmas, no nothing. But it was good. It set me up. I'm not saying it was bad. It was just the price I paid because that's what I wanted to achieve. But then I got to this stage where 
I decided that wasn't what I wanted to do anymore. I thought there's got to be better to all this work. There's got to be better rewards out there. Um, and that was sort of the start of my midlife crisis in my late 20s. <laughs> so, yeah. So, 1999, fork in the road. There was the Newcastle to Coffs. Can you tell us about the pizza night at the Black Butt Hotel? Well, we came home at Christmas um, at the turn of the century. So, 1999 to 2000, we came home. And we wanted to sell the house we had here. We said, we'll sell the house here, we'll go back and we'll, we'll live in Newcastle. And we, we spoke to local real estate agents and we never got any bites at all about selling the house. So the market here was pretty, pretty slow, obviously, because nothing came of it. So we went, okay. So one day, Karen and I, well, I think it was about March, we're down at the pub in Newcastle and we said, well, why don't we just sell Newcastle and move back home to Coffs? Which I actually, you know, was probably the driver of it. Because I really wanted to start a business. I wanted to start something. Because I'd been working for this company. I thought, no, I want to have a bet on myself. And when you talk about the fork in the road, essentially what that meant for me was if we sold one of the houses, I could be debt free and I could start again. So it just meant I could sell everything we owned. And I did. Cars, one of the houses, furniture. Sold everything. And we moved home and we started again. So yeah, that's, that was in actually June 2000s when we physically moved home. So yeah. I was amazed by his memory and the dates he can remember. Incredible. So you sold everything and you decided to go into IT. Why IT? Yeah, I, what I, I learn a lot in, in the insurance business about recurring revenue. Because what they do in the insurance business is they, they constantly have recurring revenue. Every six months I'd go back and see the clients and I'd either renew their policies or I'd upgrade their policies or I'd ask for leads. And it was recurring revenue, recurring business. So one of the things I wanted to do was recurring revenue of some form. And I wasn't smart enough to write music or make a movie or write a book. But I thought, well, you know what? Going back to my days of computers, I reckon I could write some software. So that's why I decided to start learning IT. Uh, yeah, so I had a few little ventures with that, but I, I won't mention those today. But the first few IT things I did didn't work very well, needless to say. But I really thought I could make something out of IT, and that's why I picked IT. I figured I, I could, one thing I could do is invest my time, because I had time, I wasn't working, was in learning. So I just studied and studied and studied. And uh, yeah, I didn't do any courses or anything, just went online and started learning and that's what I did. And as a startup grind, tell us about the grind in the first two years. You know, when you start new business, there, there's this hard grind to go through and, you know, had to learn. Yeah, it was really tough because there was no money. Like literally no money. Um, had no income for the first couple of years. So once we sold Newcastle, like I said, it was, it was clean slate. It was great. We had no money though. It was a clean slate of nothing, except we owned a house. So it was great. I had a roof over our heads and that was very good. And the other thing that happened was our parents or Karen's parents were going around Australia. So we also had somewhere to live while the tenants were moving out of the house we're in. So we, we were okay to start. So I had no money, but what I did have was time to learn so I spent a lot of time online learning um, and doing the grind, as it's called. And, and the way I learned how to do computers was I'd go out and talk to people. And I was very lucky that Coffs Harbour at the time was pretty advanced with IT for, for a couple of reasons, which I won't get time into tonight. So I'd go into these businesses in Coffs and say, because I could sell, I had no fear of going and knocking on the door. And I'd go, hey, look, this is not quite the way it worked, but I'd go, hey, I'll go, I can do a website for you. Would you like one? And they'd all go, yeah, sure, that's easy. And I, so I'd go home and go, okay, now what do I need to do? <laughs> <laughs> quite literally, yeah, sure, you want that? Yeah, no, it's, you know, a thousand bucks or something like that, I'd charge them. I can't remember, I just picked the price out of, my, out of my head and off I'd go home and I'd have to learn how to do it. And that's how I learnt everything that I was doing. So rather than trying to create a product, I actually went to the market and, and started looking at, you know, what do you guys want? You know, so that, that was enough for me. That's how I learnt. Tell us about business judo. How did you use the judo methodology to your advantage? All right, so business judo. It's, it's probably a simple way of saying business judo is, is thinking about the win-win. Um, you know, everyone has a, a big thing across their head when you're dealing with them in business. You know, what's in it for me, right? I'm going to give you some money. What's in it for me? So when you're selling. So what I had, what I had the ability to be able to do because of my sales background was not only be able to... Um, go to some of these businesses and come up with a win-win situation. That was sort of easy. It was <laughs> business judo takes on a whole new level of stuff where 
by the time you finish, they actually think it's their idea and they're helping you. And, and even though they're big companies, it's, it was so much easier to get them to participate and be engaged if the solution that was actually coming from me, all I did was go and plant all these seeds and stuff. And I did that with so many companies. So the whole way through Renet, just so you know, my marketing budget was nothing. I didn't do any marketing. I did nothing. All I did was go and, and talk to businesses and come up with solutions and then use them to help me grow my business. And when things really started to work, they were paying me to go back and do the research to give them the product. So I was just winning multiple ways. So that's, that's a form of business judo. There's a few other examples I can give you, but yeah. So it's, it's more than just creating win-win environments. It's actually going to the people that are in your business or, or in your area and, and actually working how you can leverage upon them with, with ways to grow your business that, and, and if preferably get paid to even do that. So yeah. And sometimes you um, experience hardship or uh, there's a fork in the road again and sometimes there's a Monday morning decisions to be made. Tell us about the Monday mornings. I know where you're going here. One of the things, I didn't really set out to start a, a business called Renet. That was, I won't call it an accident, but what I did want to start was a business that had systems. I wanted recurring revenue. That was a must. Uh, I didn't know how I was going to do it, but, you know, after the business got going and Renet, I established Renet and everything was working, what happened one Monday morning was I had only $1,700 in the bank. So I know where you're going with the question. And that was like one of those moments where I'm going, well, man, you know, the business had to be sustainable and profitable all the way. I never borrowed a cent for the business, okay? So even though I had staff and wages to pay at $1,700, well, I just didn't have the money to pay wages that week unless some money came in. So what I did was I had one of those epiphany moments where I said, I'm going to change everything. You know, I, I, I did 10 years commission sales and I lived and died by the sword, right? So if I didn't go to work, I've got nothing. Even as a manager, you still got overrides and stuff like that, so... And it was great having employees, but you know, getting to follow the system sometimes where clients have to pay before they sell it to go live wasn't so strict for them. So what I did was I, I come up with a financial system that morning that meant what they could actually get was a pay rise, but part of the system was that people had to pay and that they then got bonuses and they got incentives based on everything working in, this, in the business. So all the systems started to work. And I tied into, the, uh, I tied into those systems, their, their bonuses, I tied into that system the accounting, so it automatically when a job got done, it invoiced the people. So it was an it was an amazing system. But that was one of those Monday mornings where no money, have to make changes. Have to make changes. And how do you address competition? There's, you know, the magpie anal analogy. So there's lots of competition. People attack you from everywhere. How do you address that? Well, the, the magpie analogy was pretty cool the other day. Thanks for that. I did get attacked by another one. So, yeah, uh, but yeah, with competition, look, to be honest with you, I never really saw competition as competition. Um, when I saw people that were in, in the market and, and trying to um, do the same thing I was doing, because literally I was a startup at the time. So when, when I say startup, I mean, I was going out to people and trying to tell them about the internet thingy, all right, you know, can't I just buy this software? And I'm going, no, 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 I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm leasing it to you. You've got to pay every month for it, right? And people are going, really, can't I just buy it? No, no, no. And now it's called software as a service, all right? It's all got these names, right? And Google, well, who doesn't know who Google is today? Whereas I had to try and educate people on what Google was. Um, you know, even CRMs and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, the, the, when it comes to competition and that sort of stuff, I'd go out and talk to people. I don't care if they used other software. I don't really mind. They could use two of us in the same space. Well, I don't mind. As long as you're getting off me what you want off me and you keep paying the bill, I have no ego where you have to only use my product, right? Part of business judo is it just doesn't matter. You know, so I had plenty of clients that used two products because we did certain things and they did certain things. And that was all good, right? So that was another form of, I guess, business judo or... or um, looking at the, the magpie attack. So when, when you're that focused on what you want, you don't care about anything else, when the magpies come down and swoop, you just keep on your own course, right? So it doesn't matter. Although I did on my helmet have those little cable ties. <laughs> and he still come down and hit me, so yeah. So the Cox course is all about lifestyle and we are a big fan of lifestyle for entrepreneurs as coined by Tim Ferriss. How would you describe the healthy, wealthy and wise and, you know, how do you set priorities? Well, priorities, everything for me had to be, well, obviously part of the core with the systems, with time duplication and that sort of stuff, uh, with recurring revenues. 
but everything also had to tie into these healthy, wealthy, wise principles. So one, one of the core objectives I had when I left the insurance business was from that moment onwards, nothing was ever going to own me again. I had to own everything to the point where the business didn't borrow a cent. Um, everything had short-term plans, whether I leased a car or whatever I did. So everything had these short-term goals and everything had to be healthy for me so I could be healthy, wealthy, as in I, I started investing in properties and I started buying things because I was, as a startup, I mean, I didn't know how long I was going to last. I didn't know if I was going to get absorbed by some other company or, you know, like a, a, one of these major guys comes along and just wipes me out, you know. So I went, no, no. So I made sure I invested the whole time. I kept on buying more and more stuff. So every time I had some money, I put it aside. Every time I had some money, I put it aside and just kept on investing. And then there's the wise bit. So wise enough to make sure that I make all the right decisions, staying focused on the core goals, which was, you know, spend some time with my kids, make sure my wife and I went on holidays. Uh, and I tried to make sure I did all those things with the perfect balance. I used to walk along the beach to work. And as I'd be walking along the beach, just kicking myself, going, Man, how good is this lifestyle? So I could walk along a kilometre on the beach and just go, wow. It's amazing. But then again, there was lots of times where I was in Sydney or Auckland or Melbourne or Perth and I missed out on a lot of things at the same time. So there was always a price to pay. It wasn't all roses, right? But at the same time, I could come back to this Coffs Coast region and just go, how good is this lifestyle? Yeah, I wonder how many people in Sydney can walk to their work or in Melbourne. Well, there's a funny story. So when I first started, I used to have to travel to all of those people. And then what started to happen was in the last few years it started to change and people wanted to actually come up. So it's gone from me having to travel and do the extra mile to people going, no, 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 hang on, we're going to come up and see you. So then I had to get a nice boardroom table and that sort of stuff. But, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day it changed and people wanted to come to Sawtell. They wanted to come and see me and they wanted to be engaged with the company at that level. So it all changed because of the, the, what we have up here is amazing, you know, so it all changed. How do you separate family from business? I didn't, um, but I did. I did at the same time. I, I had a couple of, I had a couple of beliefs that um, I never really did work without business or business without work. So every time we went on a holiday, we'd go camping in Byron Bay. And while we're camping in Byron Bay, I mean, they got to go surfing all day, and I'd go to Brisbane and do some work for the day, and then come back. But at least I was coming back to Byron Bay or something like that. So I never really got to to. to separate it ever so there's never work without business and never business without work it's just the way it ended up unfolding uh, and i did another thing too which was i always made sure that i the how i balanced it out was i like to call it school teacher hours so what i mean by that is you know i never quite got the nine to three but what i did i didn't mind working hard for 10 week terms you know so 10 weeks full on then some time and we'd go to the snow or we'd, we'd go to byron bay and i'd mix it all up with work anyway and that's how i balanced it out so working hard Kids, in 10 weeks' time, we're doing this. Kids, in 10 weeks' time, we're doing that. And that's how I managed to balance out all that lifestyle stuff. And they were happy to support it. Okay, Dad's going away, but we're, we're going away. And I think that worked really well for me over the time, not only for the kids, but also for the marriage. So, you know, involving everyone in the family about what we were doing meant that even though I was working 80 hours a week, I managed to have this balance over time that really seemed to work. So, yeah. Also, thanks to our sponsors and how important was accounting to your business and success? Oh, yeah, look, accounting, I, one of those software programs I did when I first started was actually accounting. So I, all, my, all my accounting software I wrote and now there's zero and all sorts of things worth squillions of dollars and you think, man, I could have done that. <laughs> But I didn't. I just wrote what I needed to write to get my business to do what it needed to do, all the automatic invoicing and everything else. But... You, know, you talk about accounting, I mean, uh, Fiona mentioned it earlier, but you know, the, in 1991 was when I first got acquainted with quality accounting with, with Dennis Jeff. You know, he was one of my mentors along the journey. When I first moved home and, and, and started employing people, I actually used the office out the back. It was a little, I can't remember how big it was, but a few square metres where I started the company in the, in the back of the accountant's office downstairs. And that was where I first started employing people. So, you know, it's... I've had a really good journey with, with quality accounting over the years as well. So um, but being able to have that mentor uh, for those years was, I, I, I really uh, value the lessons I learned from, from Dennis along the way. Now, retired, I don't want to say retired, with 46. Uh, if you think of Scott when you were 17 or when you started, 
what would you give him as an advice now? Oh, there's a couple of ways I could probably answer that. One of the things, if I was to go back and, and, and give advice to myself, as if, if I had have been the reverse, my mentor, was that you know, some of the things I was thinking was right. Um, because at the time, you know, I probably couldn't have got a mentor in the space I was in because no one was really doing what I was doing. No one was doing this online web stuff, you know, like the, all the print companies were saying this internet thing is not going to last, you know. So there was a big tech, I don't know if you remember the tech bubble um, crash that happened in like April 2000. I mean, I just left the insurance business to start an IT business, right? And there was a big technology crash and I was like, oh, what am I doing? So at the end of the day, th that I was doing the right things um, if I could go back and tell myself. And, and I guess some of the lessons I learnt over the period, which is probably a better way of saying it, was that I stayed strict on, on, in the end, a very core market. I didn't let distractions come in. So I went, no, no, this is my goal. And I could have I gone other parallels and I could have done all sorts of things. I went, no, no, I'm going to stay focused here. Because I got to learn the market, I got to learn the industry, I got to learn what they needed, and all I had to do was keep providing solutions for that and stay focused on it. And it did grow from, from literally one property as a concept to you know, where I ended up with a few agents around Coffs using the software when I first started. I mean, I didn't think it was that good, but they liked it. So I went, hey, this is really good, so I better learn more about this software thing, right? So I did. I went home just like I did everything else. I started learning more about software. And one of the proudest things I've actually got is that some of those first founding clients in the real estate business are still clients today. They're still loyal to Renet. They never, ever left or went anywhere else, and they're still clients, except for a couple that have sold out and retired. But, you know, the first 20 clients I ever had, the ones that are still in business are still clients of Renet. So that's one thing I'm really proud of. So going back, yes, was that to have a bit of confidence in myself and stay focused and don't let the distractions get away at you. So the, the magpies. The magpies. And if there's one thing you would like to give to the audience to take home tonight, what is the one thing you would give them? Look, my one thing which has driven me for the last 20 years is healthy, wealthy, wise. Have that balance, right? So, you know, have, have the balance of health. Still try and be wealthy financially, wealthy, knowledgeable wise, wealthy in so many areas in your life. And be wise enough to, you know, keep things real, you know. Just keep things real no matter where you are and, and what you're doing. So, yeah, healthy, wealthy, wise is my, my mantra, so. Thank you very much. Please put your hands together for Scott Schindler. And um, as a one of our um, long-term members and guest speakers, you will get a free T-shirt, of course, of Startup Grind. <laughs> and if your wife would like one, because I believe behind every strong man there's a strong woman or even stronger woman, you will get a T-shirt as well, if you like. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. I think that's it. And um, we will open now the audience for questions. If you would like to ask Scott a question, please do so into the microphone. Uh, you strike me as a confident man, um, learning everything off on the go and, and figuring out things for yourself in your own business. Uh, at what point did you put your confidence aside and, and understand that you needed to employ other people and outside assistance to help run your business? Yeah, so what, at what point I decided I needed to duplicate myself, um, that was probably never going to be in question. I always knew I was going to do it. Because um, time duplication is something that you know, all successful people understand is time duplication. And, and duplicating myself like I did with the sales teams, I knew I was always going to do it in the company. So when that point happened was in 2003, we were going to go around Australia for a year selling the software to real estate agents. All right, so I had a... I'd a pretty clear goal, which was I wasn't going to sell to the cities or the franchises. I just wanted to talk to the normal people from the country areas like I'm from. And they all related to me, I related to them, they were easy to deal with, and they appreciated me being there. But we left um, to go around Australia for a year, my wife fell pregnant the first month, so it turned into a nine month trip instead of a year. But on that trip, when I was selling all these real estate agents, all of a sudden I couldn't do it anymore. I could no longer continue working at night. I could no longer continue keeping up with the phone calls and everything else. It just wasn't working. So I actually came home to Coffs Harbour at Easter 2003. I flew home, left my wife and that on the Sunshine Coast. I got an office at the back of Quality Accounting. True story, little small office. I had a young guy that had asked me to do some website design work, so I got him a desk. 
I hired a girl to take some phone calls, gave her a desk and I waved goodbye and I went back on the road and I just dealt with them remotely from there on in. And that was the first time I hired staff. So it got to the point where I just had to do it. Uh, and then when we came back in September 2003, well, yeah, obviously the guys were still there and I started employing more people and the business was coming in. So I had a real, um, a real business that was going because now I had clients all up and down the Queensland coast because I did a lot of door knocking in that nine months and, and grew the business, you know, so it was a really good experience. So that point was when I just, I just couldn't do it anymore. So, yeah. Um, obviously, we live in a regional area and while there are some very talented people here who can code, there's not a lot of them. Do you have any suggestions about how to overcome that challenge and or how to attract people who can code here? Yeah, finding programmers was always tough. Um, <laughs> They, they want the Sydney money or I'll call it Sydney money in coughs and it just doesn't exist, right? But what they also get here is the lifestyle. So tend to, the other thing we get when we do find people that are good here on the coughs coast or they want to move home because they, they, like everyone else, left home at 19 or 20 and now they want to come out and they're 30 or 35, they've got kids of their own, is the loyalty is much stronger. So as much as they're tougher to find, that once you find them, they tend to stay. They're not going to jump jobs every three or six months because there's another company around the corner that's going to offer them another job. So, yeah, it was, it was harder to find them, but I was constantly looking. I never said no to anybody. Believe it or not, I was always going to hire the people that walked in my door asking for work because if they were smart enough and they were that intuitive enough to come in and say, hey, Scott, here I am, I was always going to employ them. It only ever happened once, though. It amazed me over all those years that people didn't come in asking for work or experience or anything. So once, and I employed him straight away. So, yeah, finding people is a bit tougher on the regional, especially when you want skills. But what I also wanted to do was when I found someone that had potential, which there's a bucket load of those guys, was I, I'd hire them on the potential because I was more worried about where they wanted to go than where they were. And I knew I could teach them more. Now, being self-taught, I knew I could teach them more about what I needed and, and take them on a journey of knowledge themselves. And I did a lot of that. So duplication of my knowledge through them, regardless of what they already know, it's more about where they wanted to go. So rather than looking for people highly skilled, I looked for people that wanted to get better educated and better at this experience of, of IT. And that's what I did. Hey, Scotty. Um, I'm just wondering about your acquisition. Um, was that ever the goal? Um, how did it feel like it changed the direction of the company? Did you feel like you'd lost a part of your soul or control? Um, just, yeah, wondering how that affected everything. Yeah, good question. Um, people often ask why I exited from ReNet. And, and I always had a goal of healthy, wealthy wires, right? So uh, I got to the stage where I always said, once I got to a 1,000 offices, it's at a point where I'm either going to need some help or support or the business has to change. And I wasn't sure if I was the person for that journey or not. So I got to the point a few years ago, I thought, well, what I might do is try and, and just see if someone wants to buy the business and help take me and the company on the journey without any risk for me. So I've got, I've got some money in my pocket and we can go on this new journey. And I really, really wanted to try and double the business in, in the next three years with someone else's help, right, and someone else's risk. So, you know, did it take the soul out of me? Yeah, it did, because I found out I'm not a very good employee. You know, I still work 80 hours a week, but sometimes I spend 100 bucks and I get a slap on the wrist, which to me didn't equate. So I, I, it did take a bit of soul out, but I did enjoy the journey with the new owners. Um, I would have liked to have been a bit more fruitful, but look, they were really good to me, the, the people that bought the business. Um, but it was never really the, the goal. But I, I was happy if someone come along and said, hey, Scott, here's some money. Uh, let's take this business and try to get it to the next level. And I could de-risk everything. Because, you know, to me, that was wise. I, I would be young enough to be financially independent enough that I could actually stop working if I wanted to. And, and that was part of the goal. I went, you know what? I'm going to take the bird in the hand instead of two in the bush. And I'm going to try and, you know, reassess everything. The next fork in the road is the one I'm in right now. And I'm really enjoying life, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's been good. So did it change the business? It, it did a bit, but, you know, hey, once I made that decision, I just stuck to the decision and I stayed loyal to what we did for three years and now it's their turn. Hi, Scott. Earlier on when you started your story, you talked about when you're at those early stages of growth that your initial clients and yourself, you leveraged off each other. Could you give us an example of that? So I'll give you a couple of examples how I leveraged off some of the clients, um, apart from the obvious, which is, is um, them paying me to, say, build websites and stuff like that. What would happen, 
uh, to give you an example was in November 2003, I had this, had this office ring me. I did a bit of e-marketing, so I wrote my own e-marketing program. They rang me out of the blue off one of these e-marketings that went out. And they're now uh, Queensland's largest rent roll manager. So they went from three offices then to 26 offices now. So an example of that was I'd go to them and say, well, listen, what else would you need? And I'd go, well, all right, well that's going to cost you $1,000. And they'd say, okay, Scott, here's the $1,000 because they get what they want. But what I was really doing was getting paid $1,000 to Im improve the software, if that makes any sense. So that's some of the ways I leveraged off, off those guys. So they were happy. Look, if they were to pay for that product on their own, it might have been thousands. But I said, look, just kick the tin a little bit, $1,000 or $1,500 or $500, whatever it was, and I'll, I'll get it done for you. And, you know, that, that mantra ran through the business all the way to the end. So every time I went and did something, you know, last year I had no idea what we were, were doing, but we had this mud map of products we were going to do for the year. Week one, uh, a major international real estate corporation rings us up and says, hey, Scott, we want you to do this stuff. So we went, well, that part of the mud map's the one we're doing next because they were paying for it. So right up until the death of, of me in that business, that's how I ran the business. So, And that's part of business judo, you know, so... Yeah, well, here's an opportunity to not only get some money, but we're now creating solutions and, and they're doing it for us. And that also gave us access to another hundred odd offices, you know, so that we didn't have to do any marketing. They were just there. So what's next? What I'm really, really enjoying doing at the moment is sharing the experience I went on and the journey I went on. And, and for me, I, I am starting to compile uh, all the things I did over the years into some notes. I do want to write a book I'd love to put it out there and you know hopefully people like the book too so I'd love to be able to share it and um, I really am enjoying having people come up to me and go look I'm in business and what do you think and I you know I've had I've had so many uh, even though there's only been I'll call it you know less than a dozen that have come and asked me to do some mentoring with them now I've had some real life-changing moments with them already and I go wow so that part for me is like it's it's so satisfying I'm really enjoying that part of the of my journey right now so and um, yeah we'll see where that goes but at the moment I'm enjoying sharing the knowledge and, and empowering others on their journey. Scotty has there ever been a time when you wanted to give up and how did you overcome that? Look there was never a time where I wanted to give up like ever. Um, one of the things about having little short-term goals and commitments was there was no, no way you'd give up. So when you, know, when you own the business, the buck stops with you. So I always just dealt with everything. But it, you know, I created the business and I, I really enjoyed the business. Um, but there was never a time where I wanted to give up, ever. Uh, and still to this day, if you'd have asked me a year ago, would I be still at Renet? I would have said, yeah. But you know, it turns out they had other plans and I had other plans, so we, we parted ways. But you know, at the end of the day, I never, ever wanted to give up. So uh, even when times were tough, what I did was I just went, well, well, how do I turn this into an advantage? What do I do? How do I spin this around into something that's going to be a positive? And I just got good at that. So there was never a time, no matter how, what the hassle was. We had server outages. We had client issues. We had all sorts of things that came up from time to time, right? And some real horrible things. Like we had a server go out for 12 hours and everyone's mail wasn't working on a Friday night and people are screaming at me and I'm going, oh. But I never, ever wanted to give up. You know, so all I could do is reassure people was that we're going to try and fix things up and we, you know, oh, but will it ever happen again? Look, I can't promise that, right? Everyone has their little things, right? Uh, but what I can promise is that, you know, we, we continue to strive to, to deliver a product that is going to work and, and continue to improve that. That's the only thing I could promise, but I never, ever wanted to give up. You, one of the things that in my experience with what I've been doing is that a lot of startup people don't realise how important sales is in their business. I was going to ask you how much of your own sales experience contributed to your success and if it was significant, is there a tip for people in business that you might pass on in terms of sales? Yeah, good question. So how important do I think sales is in a business, man? It's like the, the, if I had to give a trade, it's certainly not IT. I mean, I learnt what I did and I learnt... Like, I, I couldn't work at Harvey Norman and sell anything in the computer section. Terrible. So I just couldn't do it. But I, I, learnt, to, I learnt to write software, I learnt to deliver it. Um, but what I always had the ability to do was sell. So what I had the ability to do was, was think of a business, that was fine, but I could go out and I could talk to people. And not only could I talk to people, I could talk to them in such a way where the presentation meant they were buying the product. So, you know, it was... Sales is imperative. And, and sometimes... 
parents ask me, oh, you know, my son wants to get into IT or my daughter's studying this, what do you think they should do? And I say, learn sales. Because, you know, look, there's the Instagram of the world and the Facebook of the world, but most other businesses are businesses and you've still got to go out and talk to people. So you have people want to spend money with you. They've got to want to stay to be a client. You know, and, and, and that has to happen. And your ability to be able to sell and deliver what you're selling is important. So I, I agree. Sales is right up there. I never spent any money on marketing and that's a fact. And I did some for fun. All right, I'll sponsor this for $1,000 and see how that goes. But otherwise, it was always going out and dealing with people and, and, and selling the product and service at all times. Selling myself, selling the staff, reassuring everybody about the business and the product. It was always selling. Always, always selling. Number one tip. I don't really have a number one tip. Um, don't be afraid of sales. And, and, and my, probably my number one tip is uh, email is not selling. You know, that's just correspondence, right? E talking to people and getting out belly to belly is where sales and business happens. Is probably my number one tip. Technique around that, well, that's a different story altogether and I could just, all of a sudden you'll open up a can of worms here, I'll be going for an hour or two. So I won't get into sales technique techniques. But yeah, forget about anything else other than belly to belly. Whether it's talking to people over a phone by a distance or actually physically getting in front of them, you've got to get out and talk to people. You know, so email is not a sales tool, nor is social media. That's just marketing or it's messaging. You've got to physically talk to people and create those relationships. I just want to say firstly, thanks for sharing your story. Your June 2000 is very much my October 2017. We moved from Sydney, had no money but had the house situation. Um, you talk about healthy, wealthy and wise, which I really resonate with, but... I'm only a year into my business and that healthy part is not working. I'm doing the 80 hours, I'm putting in the work, I'm in the grind. I've just hired my first employee literally today. But how do I, did you always have that healthy? Did you really for that whole time, that first year of your business? Or is that just where you've come to now? <laughs> One of the reasons why that became my mantra was being healthy, wealthy, wise. Yeah, that's was one of the main reasons was I got to the stage where I was I was fitting into size 38 pants and I just went you know that's this is not me anymore and this was in in the 90s in the insurance business one of the reasons why I went this isn't working you know here I'm working hard and I'm I'm, I'm sort of breaking even and I'm, I'm not healthy so what I started to change and I kept a diary of it and I lost the diary and then I found the diary now I've lost it again but I kept a diary <laughs> Well, what I decided to do was make sure that the healthy part became a focus. It was, became a priority. In other words, if you make it a second thing that you do in the day, it just never fits in. It just doesn't fit in. It's just, it's gone. And, you know, I'd go away to conferences and I'd be on the two-week conference run in February. And, you know, I was drinking and, you know, partying and eating. And I'd put on five kilos in two weeks. It was terrible. I mean, I got this ability to go bloop. I don't know why, but I have that ability, right? So then I've got to work on it for the next few weeks. I've got to then go, hang on a minute, back into a bit of healthy eating and a bit of exercise, and it just becomes a priority. Uh, if you don't prioritise the healthy part, it's the last part you'll actually do. It is always the last part. But simple things like a walk to work. It was a simple thing, right? So I did that sort of stuff. So I said, okay, how do I contain healthy uh, or maintain healthy? And I just made it a priority in, in what I did, so yeah. Which wasn't easy because, you know, when you're out on the road, you're in airports, you're, you're travelling, you just want something quick to eat. It's not easy to be healthy, I've got to be honest with you. Um, and for me, yeah, I, I don't know, I just have this ability to blow up. So, yeah, I've got to, I've got to be extra careful. So it's a good hobby to have to go for to be Australian champion in surfing, isn't it? Any more questions? I've got one. What can the Coffscores do to inspire entrepreneurs to move up to the Coffscores from, you know, the big smoke, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, or even overseas? To inspire them, to show them photos. That would be a good start. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this is because I believe um, there's, a, there's a lot of regional businesses and a lot of regional people that are very successful people you know, you can go down to Sydney and, and you can see million dollar boats on the harbour, and, but are they really happy? Are they really enjoying it? Maybe they are. But I know I've met a lot of people in the insurance days and, and, and even in the Renet days that are country people and they're really successful, really nice people. So if I'm, someone wants to get out of that grind of Sydney 
or, or Melbourne or those city lives and, and come up and have a lifestyle. I mean, this is, for me, it was imperative. Even when I sold the business with the question that was asked, it made it hard to find someone because I said, I'm not moving anywhere. This is it. I am staying here. Part of the deal is Renet is staying in Sawtell because my staff have the same thing with the healthy, wealthy wives. You know, they want to be here because it's just a great spot to live. You know, it's a minute to work or two minutes to work and, you know, peak hour around Sawtell can be terrible, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Sometimes there's actually, you know, cars have to stop for you at the pedestrian crossing. It's terrible. <laughs> and that, you know, so that's what people can do. They can run a successful business from here. We have seven flights a day to Sydney. When I first started, people told me I had to move to Sydney and I just went, no, I'm not doing it. If I can't create a business in Coffs Harbour or Sawtell, I am not creating anything other than what I need and that was it. It was part of the rules. Right down to the sale of the business. I wasn't going anywhere. It had to be a regional business because it made me have the balance of healthy, wealthy and wise.